Right, good morning, everybody. Listen, last night blessed my heart to see y'all just going in for Jesus like that. That was beautiful. Beautiful to just hang out and linger in the presence of God together. Um, yeah, that was that was something else. I mean, two, two hours. Y'all was going in. My knees was hurting, y'all. I think I was over there. I was jumping around trying to act like I'm y'all age. But that was a little bit hard for me, but it was still good. So um, let's let's pray real quick, and uh, then we'll we'll dive into the word for a few minutes, and um, then we'll eat lunch and stuff like that, and get home. home. Um, God, thank you so much that you call us yours. Thank you, God, that you are a good father to us. Thank you, Lord, for extending grace upon grace upon grace. Lord, we receive it. Make us your open vesicles, your open vessels, excuse me, Lord, to receive. I'm getting stuck in biology. Um, but Lord, I pray that you would fill us up in this moment. That you would speak to us in profound ways. God, although my words may not be pointed to people's specific situations, I ask that through the power of the Spirit, that you would bring things to remembrance. That you would rebuke the lies of Satan. God, that you would encourage and fill up and bind up where it needs to be filled up and bind up. Lord, I pray for strongholds to be broken in this moment. Lord, I pray for the mercy of heaven to fill this place, that it would be palpable, that it would be known, that it would be experienced, not just on a retreat high, Lord, but that it, they would walk in the grace and the mercy and the admonition of the Spirit as they go back on campus to Dartmouth, to Harvard, as they go back into their lives, as they have relationships, as they're in their classes, as they're thinking about even next summer, God, uh, and what they're gonna do for internships or jobs if they're seniors. I pray that they will walk in the way of a sainted life. That they would embrace the holiness that God has stamped upon them. And we pray this in your name, amen. You say amen, Taylor? That's good, baby. Um, yeah, sorry. She say amen all the time. She's a, she's a little churchy, y'all. She's a little churchy. Um, so we, we've been talking about uh, the gospel this weekend. Uh, we've been thinking about uh, getting kind of the double barrels, if you will, when, when Fetty started us out with laying out what is the gospel, God, man, Christ response, and he laid it out so beautifully, beautifully for us. And then we had Tim lay, uh, kind of bring this exhortation to us to be evangelizers, to be declarers and demonstrators of the good news of Christ. And then we had Braden and we had Sadie take us through dealing with shame, uh, and honor and being unashamed and how beautiful that was for the meditation especially. Y'all, I saw, uh, first time, I ain't gonna lie, I, I saw uh, Jesus with a fro. Um, I was like, all right, Jesus, okay, okay, Jesus, that's how you gonna do, okay, all right. Bless my heart. Um, and that meditation was so beautiful, but this morning I want us to think about, when we think about sanctification, that may be a word that you are familiar with or aren't familiar with, we're, we're gonna talk about it. Um, but I want you to realize that the gospel propels us forward into the continual saving work of Christ. And that is a life of greater holiness. Uh, and when we talk about holiness, people, many times, many different things may come to your mind. One, you may feel like um, uh, holiness is, uh, is this thing that you cannot attain. And I would say, yes, that's true. Uh, but then you might feel like holiness is this thing that uh, you don't want to get close to because the scriptures talks about that we are on holy ground when God is talking to Moses. And we might return back to that. And he says, hey, take off your shoes, boy, because you on holy ground. And so it's something that you cannot approach. It's almost unapproachable. God is almost unapproachable. Uh, in his holiness. And so we have to consider that or maybe even presents a, a caricature of a type of Christian in your mind. The holy roller, the, the Bible thumper, uh, the person that has always got a scripture and ain't ever did nothing wrong. Uh, right. And so holiness can can produce a lot of things. But I think that there's a beauty in holiness. There's a beauty in being called to holiness 
from the Lord. And then there's also a beauty in being equipped to being empowered by the spirit to be holy. And so we want to think about that a little bit and just sit with that. Last night, Sadie brought up a great word that I love, justification. Um, justification, and it literally just means to be legally declared um, like free from your sin and from your debt. Like you have been redeemed. You have been, the price has been paid. Uh, there's this one theologian, maybe you guys know him. Um, his name is Wayne Grudem. He has this big, huge systematic theology book. Maybe some of y'all got it. Yeah, I feel like it's like, yeah, yeah. Uh, I got this book. I call it my superhero playbook, okay? Um, that's what I call Wayne Grudem's systematic theology. And Wayne Grudem says this about, specifically about justification. He says, it's the instantaneous legal act of God in which he, one, thinks our sins, uh, thinks of our sins as forgiven and Christ's righteousness as belonging to us, also known as imputed righteousness. And two, he declares us to be righteous in his sight. He declares us to be righteous in his sight. It's this right standing. It's this legal term. Um, you, you, you did some stuff. You were guilty. Um, you, you should have been put in jail, locked away. But the judge had someone stand up in your place. And because of that, that person took on Jesus. He took on the wrath that you deserved and took on the death that you were supposed to die in your place, but resurrected and ascended to the Father, God the Father Almighty. He now stands before God the Father on your behalf, declaring you and me justified. Yes. Sanctification is different, but is connected to justification. Right. Uh, it, it's this. And, and I want to continue on the Grudem train here for a second. Uh, Grudem says he, he defines sanctification as a progressive work of God and man that makes us more and more free from sin and more like Christ in our actual lives. I want to add a final point to what Grudem says. Grudem, he, he, called, he heard what he says is a progressive work of God and man that makes us more and more free from sin and more like Christ in our actual lives. But my final point to that is that it's the act of God and the process of man of both being holy and becoming holy. It's a, it's a both and. It's a, it's a both and. It's an already not yet. It, there's a tension in the reality of that you are already positionally holy, positionally sanctified, but yet progressing in your holiness and in your sanctification. We'll get into that in a little bit too. So I want to start with this. We got to start with God. We got to start with that God is holy. And so I want you to just hear these scriptures, um, how God is portrayed as holy. And so to be holy, God, it just means that he's holy other. W-H-O-L-L-Y. He's holy other. He's perfect and blameless and sinless. He's spotless. He's pure. We can go on, whatever we want to describe him as. But he's untainted because he's God. And then Exodus 15, 11 says, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? Who is like God? Exodus 15, 11 says, but 1 Samuel 2, 2 says, there is none holy like the Lord. There is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Psalm 99 and verse 9 says, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain for the Lord our God is holy. Satan said his nap down. I think I'm almost wrong. Isaiah 6 and 3 said, and one called to another and said, these are the angels, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then Revelation 4, 8 said, and the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, holy. Holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. You see, if we go from Genesis to Exodus to Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and on, even into the end of the scriptures, Revelation, God is proclaimed as holy. 
He's proclaimed as standing and sitting outside of us. He cannot even be approached because you and I carry sin. If we go back to, you know, Genesis 1, God's created Adam and, and Eve. In Genesis 3, the fall happens where man is literally, there's a separation. There is a chasm that cannot be traversed by our own actions. And so we stand afar because if we were to literally enter into the presence of God with our impurity and our sinfulness, we may cease to exist. God is holy. But then there is this call from the Lord, which is really interesting, that I think is almost paradoxical in some ways. Uh, there's this call from the Lord that says, and the good old KJV, King James Version says, be ye holy as I am holy. Now, when I, when I hear that scripture, and there, it's, it's repeated in the Levit Leviticus 11, uh, 44 and 45, then Levit Leviticus 19, 1 through 2. Uh, and you can go on throughout the scriptures first. Peter um, chapter 1, verses 15 and 16 says the same thing. Be ye holy as I am holy. And what is God doing when he's calling us to reflect him? What is God doing when he's asking us to be holy as he is holy. If you also to go into Matthew 5, look at the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about you need to have a perfection. This is Jesus speaking. And you're like, how is this possible? Because we've been told over and over again, if we go into the Old Testament, specifically Jeremiah, and we hear that our, that our hearts are wicked and deceitful, that our nature is broken, but yet we are called to be holy. How do we wrestle with that? How do we live into that tension? Remember I mentioned already earlier the already and not yet. How do we sit with that? I want to read these scriptures for a second and then we'll, we'll get into it a little bit. Leviticus 19 verses 1 through 2. It says, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, be holy because I, the Lord, your God, am holy. If we were to go to Leviticus uh, 11, uh, verse 45, it says, I am the God who brought you up out of Egypt. Therefore, be holy as I am holy. Why would he say that? It's very interesting. Uh, in Leviticus 19, it's actually called the, the Holiness Code. If anybody's like studied Hebrew Bible, there's a plug for the Hebrew Bible course. Take it if you can, uh, Dr. Cohen. Uh, but uh, he, he talks and talks about, Dr. Cohen talks about this Holiness Code, which is all of Leviticus 19 that just lays out ways that the Israelites were supposed to be a holy people. But what I find really interesting in Leviticus 11, verse 45, is that God says what he did for them, and then he says, be holy as I am holy. What's interesting about that is because he's saying that my covenant love, that my agreement and compact with you, my connection and relationship with you, almost, not almost, it does necessitate that you step into holiness, that you step into a blamelessness, a purity, a sinlessness. I'm building the tension for you here for a second. First Peter, verses 14 through 16, it says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. But as one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Peter is sitting here quoting Leviticus 11 and Leviticus 19 again. Is, 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 is rumbling in the ears of the Jewish believers and he's, they're hearing this, like, I'm supposed to be holy, but you and I, we both know that on our best days, we wrestle with sin. So how do we sit in this tension? First Thessalonians verse four, chapter four, verse seven says, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Let's talk about purity and impurity. If we were to go to Exodus chapter 3, Exodus chapter 3 is where Moses sees the burning bush, the bush that has an, uh, a fire that is uh, that it does not consume it, right? And so the bush is burning. It's a theophany. It's the appearance of God to um, uh, Moses. And Moses goes, and, and as I mentioned earlier, God says to him, take off your shoes for you are on holy ground. Let's pause there for a second. 
You see, in our very American Western way, we live as there is a secular and there is a sacred divide. We say we get dressed up, beautified, smell good, look good, slick our hair back if you got some. I don't. Um, on Sundays, and we get, we go and we worship the Lord. But on Monday through Saturday, that's the secular time. Monday through Saturday, we can do whatever we want to do. Or sometimes we act that way. But on Sunday, we, we're going to be with our Bibles open and our notebooks ready and singing the praises of God because we live as though there is this sacred, secular divide. I'm here to tell you that's false. Um, uh, what we see with God, especially when we come to Exodus 3, is that when he tells Moses, boy, you are on holy ground, what that can literally be extrapolated to is that, first of all, the whole earth is full of his glory. And if we continue to live in this falsity of there being a sacred secular divide, it means that we compartmentalize our lives and we never allow true holiness to be, which true holiness means that every area, every sphere of our lives is submitted to the rule and reign of Jesus. And so when we begin to deal with the sacred secular divide and we begin to embrace that every place where we put our foot is literally the footstool of heaven and it is the place that God calls holy even when there is mess and sin running around that then we begin to literally have a paradigm shift and so as we sit with that and we wrestle with this idea of purity and impurity God tells Moses take off your shoes because boy there ain't no sacred secular divide it's all sacred we think about this idea, if you look in Leviticus especially, it's all these laws laying out how not to bring about impurity. There's this idea in the Old Testament scriptures of transference of impurity to purity. Maybe it was some of the laws, maybe you know, like do not touch a dead thing, right? Otherwise you would become ceremonially impure. Or if a woman is having her cycle, you, she's to go off for a certain amount of days and not to be engaged with, right? Because you could become impure, right? But what something interesting happens, if you turn to Isaiah chapter six, that's really interesting. We, we see there is a bit of a shift. In Isaiah chapter six, oh, I love this, I love this passage. If you look at verse one, it says, in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord seated on high and lofty throne, and the hem of his robe filled the temple, and seraphim were standing above him, and they each had six wings, with two that covered their faces, and two that covered their feet, and with two they flew, and one called to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies, his glory fills the whole earth, that sacred sacred divide does not exist. Uh, the foundations of the doorway shook at the sound of their voices and the temple was filled with smoke. Then I said, woe is me, this is Isaiah, for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips. He's impure. And live among a people of unclean lips because my eyes have seen the king and the Lord of armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me and in his hand was a glowing coal. This is coming from God. That he had taken from the altar with tongues and he touched my mouth with it. And he said, now that this has touched your lips, your iniquity is removed and your sin is atoned for. This is very powerful. And it's so powerful because what's happening here is we're seeing for one of the first times that literally the impurity is not transferring to the purity, but the purity or the pure is transferring to the impure. Guys, this is good news. If we were to go on, if we think about the temple, the temple is the place where God's presence resided. And you talk about the Holy of Holies, where when people would get all ready to go into the Holies of Holies, these priests, they would take it so seriously, right? Uh, because you're going into the very presence of God and there can be no impurity where there is purity. Well, the temple, and if you went to Ezekiel 37, we won't read it for the sake of time, but if you went to Ezekiel 37, I would encourage you to, to read it later. Uh, but what, something really interesting happens. There is a, a gush of water that begins to flow from the temple and that it goes out to replenish the land. 
Now, this same imagery is used in the New Testament, and it was actually uh, mentioned very briefly in John chapter 4 last night when the woman was at the well, and Jesus said that there you will have uh, uh, living water coming from you. But also, if you were to run all the way to the book of Revelation at the end of time, it talks about the temple. Again, from the throne room of heaven, there is a river of flowing water that comes to uh, the earth and begins to reshape it. What's happening here is that the pure is there's a transference from the pure to the impure. And Jesus makes it possible. It is Jesus that makes it possible because we see Jesus when he's going around touching and healing these lepers. He was saying, yes, I am the holy God. And what I have done, I have descended. I have stepped down from glory. Philippians 2, the kenosis. And I am choosing to literally transfer my purity over to your impurity. And I am removing the stain. I am removing the blot from you. This is beautiful. So let's talk about sanctification some. So now we got this idea of be you holy. We got this idea of, um, uh, of the holiness of God. But when we talk about sanctification, there's two things to, to kind of set your mind on. There's positional sanctification and there's progressive sanctification. Your positional sanctification is established. It's established. It's your established holiness as sons and daughters of the king. For example, you, your parents... Uh, your parents can't say that you ain't your, that you, that you aren't theirs, right? Like same thing. There has been an establishment in heaven because you have accepted and believed in Jesus. Uh, you've taken on his robe of righteousness. We'll come back to that. And now you stand positionally holy. Now, under that robe of righteousness that's been given from the king, from Jesus, from our big brother, there, there may be a whole lot of darkness and anxiety and filth and doubt uh, and sin struggles. But under that robe, when God looks at us, he sees the stamp of heaven. And this is good news. Hebrews 9 verses 13 through 14 says, for the the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctified for the purification of flesh. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God to purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. I'm going to keep moving. And Hebrews chapter 10 verse 10. And by that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all, sanctification can also mean to be set apart, to be consecrated, to literally be put aside for a special purpose and reason. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14 says, For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. It is through the work of Christ that you and I get to stand and before God without shame. It is through the work of God, through the story of the good news that we tell about him living a perfect life and dying and or being resurrected and ascending that we get to stand boldly with that robe of righteousness covering us. We're wrapped up in it. It's our imputed righteousness. I don't know about you, but sometimes I like a little bling bling. Um, and when I think about... Um, the, this robe of righteousness, when I, when I think about how it is uh, wrapped around me and how heaven literally sees the garments of divine royalty wrapped around us, creation, those who have been marked by the son of the living God, it messes me up in a good way. But let's talk about progressive sanctification. So progressive sanctification, it is this idea that uh, you have a duty, you have a role in your growing holiness. You get to partake in the process of becoming holy. You've been set aside as holy positionally, but now you are growing up into it. It's the already, not yet. You've already been proclaimed holy, but yet you are still developing. It is still churning in you. 
as you grow into your holiness and become more like Christ. Philippians chapter 2 verses 12 through 13 can confuse us sometimes. I want to read it. Uh, and it says, it's the, it's the passage, if I can find it, uh, it's the passage that talks about that we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And I feel like it's important to, to hear. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. And it reads like this. Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. See, you, you even hear in these two verses, this positional holiness, this positional sanctification, but also your responsibility to, to, to work. Not to work to earn, but to work from. Not to work to get, but to work from your position of justification. To work from your saved status. To do so in fear and trembling with reverence. Right? And so as we sit with that, the big question comes with, what do we do when we just can't stop saying that? Because that's, that's the reality, right? That we, we find ourselves, Paul talks about it in Romans, that even when he tries not to sin, he still finds himself sinning. And so I've got some practical suggestions for us especially when it comes to strongholds. And when I use the word stronghold, the scripture does too in 2 Corinthians 10, verses four through five. The stronghold concept is this idea that um, Tim brought up last night. He said it's called besetting sin. It's, it's just a sin struggle you can't seem to shake, right? Uh, it, it could be many things. It could be you, you just lying all the time. You, you're lying about who you are and your identity. You're struggling sexually. You're struggling um, with, with, with being thoughtful uh, about how to care for each other or care for other people. Or you just mean sometimes. You're just rude and nasty, right? That, that can be a sin struggle for some people, right? But this is what I want to suggest to you. Three things, two things. To practically deal and progress in your sanctification, you need to submit and surrender. You just submit and surrender. My grandfather, who was my pastor growing up, would always quote this scripture to me. James chapter 4, verse 7. He says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. This is powerful. There's, there's, there's almost an equation in there, right? Submit yourself. Place yourself under the authority of God. Then resist the devil. Set up practical boundaries. If you know you're struggling sexually and you're having sexual immorality of some sort, whether it be pornography or having sex outside of marriage, whatever that may be, set up some practical boundaries in your life. Resist the devil and he will do what? He will flee from you. Submit and surrender. Surrender also can mean when, when, when a military uh, used to surrender back in the day, let's, let's go back about a thousand years, and, and they would, would, would go to the general to surrender, they might cry out, I, I give up. I, I wave the white flag. I'm putting my gun down. I'm putting my sword down. And so for us, we need to surrender to God. That means that even in the midst of our sin struggle, even if you find yourself literally in the act of sinning, in that sin, that stronghold, that besetting sin that you have, that you may need to cry out to the Lord, Lord, I, I'm here again. Lord, I find myself in this place again at odds with your holiness. And so we cry out. We surrender. True holiness is surrendering every sphere of your life to the rule and reign of Jesus. Every area. You cannot compartmentalize your life from God. You, there can't be a section of your life that you, you give up. There can't be an identity portion or a sexual, a sexual portion of your life or even a racial or ethnic portion of your life. Hey, God, you can't touch that. There can't be an intellectual portion of your life that you just set aside and say, hey, that's not really for you, God. There, he wants all of it. Submit and surrender. 
cry out, bow before him in authority, even in the midst of your sin, because this gracious, truth-filled God will take you right where you are, in the middle of your sin. Lastly, strive. So submit and surrender, but strive. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 says, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Strive. And when you strive, what I mean is fight. I just had to have another S word. I like S's. Um, fight. Maybe you guys are familiar with the concept of fighter verses. It is verses that you put to memory. Because uh, uh, once again, my grandfather taught me this scripture in the good old King, King James Version, Psalm 119, verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Put to memory scripture to fight back Satan with. When, when Jesus was tempted, and I heard this old pastor named Pastor Evie Hill preach this one time. He said, when Jesus went to the wilderness and was tempted by Satan, and he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so as Satan came, he just hit him with scripture. He's fighting. He just hit him with scripture. And so some of the scriptures in my own life that I, and I want to encourage you to find your own is Psalm 5110. When I was wrestling in my own strongholds, especially in college, Psalm 5110, I would go to Psalm 5110. It's actually on that sign down by the hill by the dining hall. And it says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. In fact, I want to read just a little bit of Psalm 51. It says, create in me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me, but restore the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. Then I will teach the rebellious your ways and sinners will return to you. Get you a fighter verse. Maybe you need to take on Psalm 119, 11. Thy word, if I hid my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Or 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 through 5, that the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. And on the contrary, they have divine power to demolish, all right, hear that, demolish your sin struggle, your strongholds. And we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Or we go to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, 2, which says that you need to flee sexual immorality. Right? And lastly, as you're striving, as you're fighting, confess and repent. If you need a blueprint of, of how to repent, of how to turn away from your sin and to do it over and over again, just look at Psalm 51. Start at verse one and read through that thing and just sit and meditate on it. I can't tell you how many times in my life where I've had a stronghold that has popped up and reared its head. Satan has tempted me to despair. And I had to come back to Psalm 51 and be reminded, as I said in verse one, be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion. Blot out my rebellion. That's David speaking after he had just taken Bathsheba and killed her husband. Strive, confess, repent. And lastly, I mentioned this before, but embrace the role of righteousness and cry out for the spirit, Spirit's empowerment. Embrace your role of righteousness. Remind yourself, speak to yourself. Self, Damaris, I am the beloved of God. Damaris, I have been created righteous and sit in right standing with the Lord because of my Savior. But cry out. I think sometimes we get so cerebral in our faith that we forget to embody the practices of our faith, the postures of our faith. I know some of you may have grown up in traditions where you would never raise your hand and worship, uh, or some of you would never have a little two-step, you know, to worship. But there's, that's okay. There's this space for that. But there also is very much space for postures that remind our minds, literally, to embrace the Lord. 
And so when I talk about crying God, I literally mean crying out. I mean, get in your room by yourself. Get your tissues or your toilet paper and have a crying session with the Lord. Begin to beg and plead heaven to remove the stronghold from your life. There's an old word um, used in, in holiness circles that says you need to tarry with the Lord. And it means that you need to sit and wait. You need to wait for the spirit of God to come upon you and move in a miraculous and spiritual and powerful way. And so I want to encourage you that in this life of sanctification and embracing the good news of Jesus, it many times means surrendering, submitting, crying out, and striving. It means confessing and repenting. It means stumbling. And I think, I think Fetty said it, being a stumbling saint. And realizing that in your stumbling, the Lord is there to steady you. He will not let you fall away. He will hold you. He will keep you. No matter what it is. Because he calls you his beloved. He calls you his own. Let's pray. And I want to give you guys some time to, just about five minutes, because I know we're coming up on time, to, to read through Psalm 51. And uh, as you read through Psalm 51, I, I want you to to get either your journal or in your mind or on your phone. And I, I want you to consider your stronghold. And if you don't have one, um, I say keep living. Because Satan knows your weaknesses and he is like a roaring lion seeking to devour. And seeking to play on our sinful and our brokenness. And so if you don't have a stronghold that you can think of today, I want you to literally download Psalm 51 in your heart today to prepare for the temptation of Satan as you move forward in becoming more like Christ, as you move forward in literally laying down every area of your life to the king. So let me pray for us, and then I'll let you read Psalm 51, and then we'll be done. God, I ask that you would move in power. We pray for deliverance from strongholds. We pray for the demolishing of strongholds. God, I pray for a fresh wind of the spirit that would revive and renew my brothers and my sisters, that would carry them on their way in their worst days, in their most despairing days, as they wrestle with whatever sin that may be in their life. As they come back and say, I'm here, God, again. I'm at this place of sin struggle again. But Lord, let them not be discouraged, but let them lean wholly on Jesus' name. Let them cling to your robe and let them be reminded of their own robe. God, if they have to, Lord, let them cry out. Let them cry real tears. Let them wipe away real snot. Let them embrace themselves and preach a grace-filled mercy to themselves. And God, I pray that you would stir up a gift in them that would remind them to open their mouths up and proclaim the work of the Lord in their life. To share that they once were, but now they aren't. They would proclaim in the midst of their friends and in their family and in their coworkers, God, and with their other classmates, God, that you are a God who delivers, who sanctifies. Teach them to submit and surrender and to strive for holiness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Take a few minutes, take five minutes, it's now.